help yourself to that. And I'm going to introduce Professor Colleen Dunn to tell you about the panel that we have today. Thank you. Hi, before I get started and introduce everyone, I'd like to just give you a reminder to put your phones on silent. You don't have to turn them off because we do have a feature where you can text a question uh, to us, to me, and then I will ask it, but you are free to ask a question uh, directly. After I give the introduction of each of our speakers, they themselves will tell you a little bit more about their career path, how they got to where they are, what they do. Then we'll open it up to the Q&A session, which can be, again, uh, old school, where you get up, introduce yourself, and uh, provide your question, or you can do it electronically. And after I introduce all our speakers, that's when you can go ahead and get your appreciation rather than um, clapping after each one. So, the first gentleman that we have comes to us from Washington, D.C. His name is John Riley. He is an attorney advisor for the Office of the General Counsel of the United States Copyright Office. He has served as the Senior Manager of Intellectual Property Enforcement at the United States Chamber of Commerce Global Initiative, or I'm sorry, Global Intellectual Property Center. He's been recognized by the American Intellectual Property Law Association for his distinguished service and contributions in the field of intellectual property law. Next, we have Dr. Steve O'Brien. He's held various industry positions at AT&T Bell Laboratories, Lucent Technologies, and a company that he co-founded in 2000 called Team Networks. He is the developer and holder of 16 patents, is a consultant to new business startups, and currently serves as the director of the Center for Excellence in STEM Education and is coordinator of the Integrative STEM Education Masters of Education program at the College of New Jersey. Next, we have uh, Dr. Rich Kleitman. He is formerly the lead scientist in corporate exploratory research and has, uh, excuse me, and then was a U.S. patent agent in the patent department of global chemical giant Roman Haas, uh, which was purchased by Dow Chemical. He is a named inventor on 14 U.S. patents in the fields of chemistry, computer display, and computer gaming. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Rich has further written and prosecuted numerous patent applications for other inventors on topics ranging from agricultural chemicals to light emitting diodes. And last but not least, we have Mr. Tracy Tindy Hunt, who is a founding member of the Bucks County law firm, Tindy Hunt LLC. He focuses his, his practice in the areas of labor, employment, small business, and contract law and including trademark registration and intellectual property protection. He is the attorney for the estate of John Pesetta and was co-counsel for the federal lawsuit filed by the estate against NFL Films that was centered on the unauthorized use of the voice of the late legendary announcer. That case resulted in new analysis of a portion of the Lanham Act the federal trademark law pertaining to the rights of publicity. So now, ladies and gentlemen, you may give your applause. <laughs> and Mr. Riley, would you like to start? Sure, and uh, something of the mic is too happy to talk. It's awkward. Can we all hear this? There's a few people in the back who cannot hear you. Okay, I feel a little Well, while Holly is fixing that, I'll ask Dr. O'Brien to introduce himself and Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? I hope. So, out of everyone in the panel, I'm probably more science and engineering oriented. Right, so I come at this from the person who invented 
um, these ideas and then patenting them. So my background is as an undergraduate, I had two bachelors, one in math and one in uh, physics, and did master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering. Uh, my specialty is semiconductor lasers and optics, so almost all my patents are related to those fields. Um, one interesting aspect that we may talk about later is one part of a patent you need to do is make sure it's applicable. Right? And so for example, my background in lasers, a lot of your, a lot of your devices, your cell phones, uh, your computers, uh, the internet is based really on lasers in a lot of ways. You really can't get signals around fast enough without lasers. And so those little southern country lasers are what I worked on in my career and have patents in that area. Um, what else? Worked a lot with startups, but you know that already. And I consult with small startups as well. Uh, changed my career in education about 12 years ago. So I do consulting still, but most of what I do now is teaching teachers how to teach engineering and science in case as well. Done, mentioned at the beginning at the outset here. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, I deal with you know, some intellectual property litigation. And, uh, I've been practicing law in Bucks County for about 18 years now. And really, I sort of kind of fell into the intellectual property side of this thing. Uh, the estate of John Pacenda, and I'm not sure if any of you, probably all too young to know. Does anybody know who John Pacenda was? <laughs> Um, how many of you have ever heard of the legendary voice of NFL Films who does all the voiceover work for all the Super Bowl pilot films? Then you've heard John Cassetta. Uh, he was the original voice of NFL Films from 1969 until 1984 when he passed away. Uh, so if you've ever seen any of the 70s or 80s highlight, Super Bowl highlight films or any number of other NFL films, then you've heard John Cassetta's voice. He was also a legendary newscaster for Philadelphia, so your grandparents were probably being found to do it was. Uh, anyway, his estate has um, earned close to a million dollars in endorsements since his death, uh, simply by the protected use of his voice. Uh, his voice is still very much in demand. Uh, in fact, if any of you have been watching football games this season, there's a Ford F-150 commercial uh, that is going on right now that uh, has a voice that sounds very much like John Pacendis, and uh, they are aligning the Ford, the toughness of a Ford F-150 truck to align it on an NFL field, you know, in the line, in the trenches, and things of that nature. Uh, but it's been airing every weekend, um, and it's actually a local comedian, Joe Conklin. Have any of you ever heard of Joe Conklin? Well, he performs every Wednesday down at the Parks Casino. Uh, anyway, uh, Joe's been doing uh, comedy in the, the New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania area for a while. And he does a Dev on John Facenda impersonation. But because we've established through litigation that uh, John's voice is a protected, uh, protected asset, basically, a protected uh, right uh, under the Pennsylvania right of publicity statute, um, he has trademark protection in that. And we have had two federal lawsuits, one with Campbell Soup Company and one with the NFL, which was done roughly. Uh, that have established that uh, his voice is unique, it is uh, notable, and it has uh, value to it. And so, uh, in the case of Campbell's, they imitated it without permission. And in the case of NFL, they distorted it and used it uh, without uh, compensating the estate uh, for its use. And so that's the area of law that I, I uh, will speak of today, but um, that's, that's what brought me into intellectual property law. I've learned quite a bit over over these two uh, rather lengthy uh, federal lawsuits. Um, both of them lasted almost four years. Uh, but the, the Facenda NFL case end, uh, ended in 2008. I'm sorry, it was filed in 2008. Um, but uh, we did finally conclude it. And based on that, now uh, companies such as Ford, before they start to go down that road and use uh, Facenda sound alike, they now contact me make sure that they have our permission, which usually comes with some level of a licensing agreement that uh, I negotiate on behalf of the estate. Uh, and the estate has done quite well. Uh, the estate has probably made way more money uh, in the last 10 years than John Facenda, unfortunately, ever earned doing the voiceover work for the NFL. Thank you. And Dr. Okay. 
Okay, so you've heard uh, some of the basic background stuff. Uh, there's one shocking detail that left out. Um, I was once as young as you guys uh, are. <laughs> I know, shocking. Anyway, um, probably when I, when I got out to the East Coast from the Chicago area, I was 26, just out of Northwestern University, and uh, it was about 10 years before I really got involved with any patenting as a scientist. Uh, knew nothing about it that whole time. So you guys are already way ahead. How many are actually here because they're interested in hearing about patents? Anybody? Okay, good, good. Um, so that, the background, that kind of background is all well and good, but I want to tell you a little bit more of a, like a, a visceral type of background item or two. This is a patent application. It's 100 pages long. That's text. That's figures. Um, one day, three and a half years ago, I was standing on the sidewalk in Doylestown with a friend of mine, and I came up with an idea for a computer game. And we started talking about it more, and then we met, uh, like, every two weeks for a year, trying to, like, figure it out better, and he had a lot of ideas that he contributed. Then I wrote this uh, patent application. As you can imagine, it was a lot of work. Then uh, we filed it, and last month it was allowed in full, and on December 1st it becomes an issued United States patent. Now, that's a lot of work, but you don't have to get rewarded with a patent for all that work. I'm going to show you another one. I'm the only inventor on this one. Seven years ago, I wrote it, and flop. okay? I had to abandon it. There were a number of reasons why I had to abandon it, but um, uh, that's not important right now. I think the thing that is important and makes me feel uh, somewhat qualified to address your issues is that I've, from both sides, I've walked down a lot of the paths that some of you are considering going down. I've not only walked down them, I've tripped, I've stumbled, I've crawled, and sometimes I've been found at the side of the road, okay? And that's the way it is in most creative endeavors, and particularly in patenting. And one of the things you want to do, want to do is get started early. I have heard this, I don't know if it's really true or not, but I've heard it said that if you try to pitch something in Silicon Valley, one of the first questions is, how many failures have you had? And if you haven't, haven't had at least two big ones, they may not take you seriously. So it's all about experience, and it's all about getting in there and getting going. Thank you. And Mr. Riley, can you hear us? I can hear you fine, can you hear me? Yes, much better. Great. Turn down my off a little. Uh, I'm Tom Riley. I work for the United States Copyright Office. Uh, for that week, I graduated Penn State um, and then the Dickinson School of Law. Um, and I've been at the office here for about four years. Um, we work in all copyright. Uh, as the other fellow panel said, one of the questions. Silicon Valley ask you if my an idea that might be come failing to have. Also, it's what have you done at your intellectual property? And uh, whether that's patents, trademarks, but I work at copyright, it's supremely important to me. Um, I will say um, very briefly, I got into copyright not because um, I was into business, but I was into creating things. I, everybody at the copyright office was funny joke. Their field uh, author or performer or whatever. I played guitar. I knew I couldn't do living, um, so I want to be as close as I can to the people who do that. Um, and as I worked in copyright for and for, I found out just how hard it is, um, but how difficult it is uh, to work in this field. Um, unlike the the I would guess that most people there don't own a patent uh, and never registered a trademark, uh, but you all own copyrights. 
when you create a work, whether that's writing a term paper or, or you know, jotting down a song, um, you have created something. Now, what I do here at the copyright office, ultimately, is try to make sure that the system is balanced enough so that people who create these things have the incentives that they need to make a living out. Um, and so we do a lot of different things for, for that end. Um, and probably the, the most visible one is the register copyrights, because although you get a copyright to create something, um, you get certain benefits from registering them. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you this day and glad to be in with this panel. The question is, how much does it cost to get a copyright? So it's a good question. Um, as I said, you know, you get a copyright when you create a uh, a work that is um, off something. So you write down a scribble or you know onto uh, copyright your name and that's um, let's say you write. Um, depending on some factors, the copyright office will let you register things for at the boat as thirty-five dollars. Um, there is a balance between what it costs us to actually process the copyright registration and what it is the benefit that people get from. Uh, so we do have some different prices. Um, you go online and you're one offer, and it's not about work for hire, and you're only registering work. It's thirty-five dollars. Um, if you wanted to register. On paper, uh, it's eighty-five dollars. Um, there's some other categories on the website, uh, one of which is important if you're a photographer and you take a collection of photos. Uh, you have to get a registration for each photo. You uh, submit. I think there's a maximum. Don't exactly seven hundred, uh, but you can do that as a collection for sixty-five. So there's a range, but. At thirty-five dollars to protect your intellectual property is probably the best bargain to go. Know. So I'm sorry, I did not get the average attorney fees for that. Um, not that I'm asking you gentlemen how much um, private attorneys charge, but in general, how much would a small business owner or any person have to pay an attorney? to get that copyright or other intellectual property uh, protection? To register a copyright, um, don't necessarily need an attorney. We have a public information office that can help guide you through the process. We have a lot of uh, information forms on our website that talk through the different works, tell people uh, what they need to do to get you registered. Um, so I would say, the vast majority of people who register works with the copyright office don't even hire an attorney. All right, who else has a question? If you're working for a company and produce something artistic, who has the copyright? Would you like to address that to a certain person? I, I think that's like a, a question for a, a lot. For probably all of us, but well, some of this might be moving a little bit into to labor law <laughs> at this point because uh, it may depend. If your employer has a, a policy, uh, employment policy on that or a handbook, you may very well lay out a policy from the company standpoint that if you are in a business that has sort of a creative component to it or somewhere where you might develop something on their time. Uh, if they have a policy on it, it most likely would state that that, product, that work product becomes theirs. They've paid you your salary or whatever your hourly work wage is, and their view, most employer view, is that that work product is their, is theirs. Then, at that point, if you know if you're using their computer, you're using their time when you were when you were clocked in, um, they have a valid argument to say that that's that their property or their their rights to it. I know in the educational component, a lot of colleges and universities specifically spell that out because there's a research component built into certain schools, and um, that is always a point of contention. 
You know, did you use our lab space? Did you use our lab time? And if you did, there's a relatively strong argument that at least they may be a co-owner, uh, if not the, the outright owner of the property. On my very first day on the job, uh, age 26, and I was going to be there for 35 years, I signed something that said they would pay me one dollar for each pack. <laughs> one dollar. That meant that, that something had exchanged hands, right? Um, but there's a, uh, another point to that, and that is, you know, it seems unfair, right? And it seemed unfair to me at, uh, at various times. But we had a, a chief scientist in our company who uh, was kind of asked that question one time. He was from uh, North Jersey. His name is Angelo Lamola. You may, yeah, sure. He, he said, well, here's the difference. You were being paid, you'd sign that everything was kind of being taken care of for you. It wasn't your mortgage, it wasn't your house, it wasn't anything like that. You didn't have to put it all on the line. And so that is convincing because you know you sign on to do exactly that. You come through, they don't feel they really need to pay. It's still controversial though. I mean, the rules can vary also. At ATT, the labs weigh about $2,000 a patent. Um, and then at universities, you can get co-ownership up to 100% ownership of the patent. You don't get paid, but the patent actually is used to give you millions of dollars. An example of that, just to throw in one other thing, going back to Northwestern University, a uh, couple of, are you familiar with the drug Lyrica that's advertised a lot, okay? Um, I know the professor who invented it, right? There's a building there that Lyrica built, big lab building. Um, it was the biggest uh, purchase of a patent ever. They paid Northwestern University $700 million up front to get that patent. And after that, they're paying royalties and they also pay them to the scientists. So it can be nothing and it can be a whole lot. I would just add that if you're, I mean, if you're in a, a research lab or something like that, then that's what your job is and that's what these gentlemen are referring to. If you just happen to be in a workplace and you come up with a great idea that's potentially not even related to the business you're in, my free legal advice would be uh, don't work on it at work. You know, take it home, work on it at night, work on it when you're not with the employer. Um, and then, you know, either go online and register it or contact an attorney or something like and that. Doctor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Notes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Document that, you know, when you were doing it and, and, and what, you know, where you were located when this was going on. Uh, because if it does turn into something that is uh, material, then you know, may have an issue with your employer. But uh, definitely do it outside the workplace if you can. All right, we have some um, questions coming in by text. If I post pictures on Instagram or Visco and someone takes one of my photos and uses it in an ad, what do I do? Call me. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I can go, and then maybe the gentleman from the USPTO uh, will, will chime in as well. Uh, if they take an ad, they lift an ad off of, a, of an Instagram or something like that, and then they picture? use uh, or a picture. Yeah, if they use your image and they use it um, in a commercial. Setting, I would absolutely, I would take that case. Um, I would absolutely suggest that you do not have the right to do that without compensating that person when you're using their image. Mr. Riley, would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah, I so I would, I would add um, every decision you make regarding um, what to do is a two part decision. Um, one is what can you do under the law? And the second is what should you do considering business and the cost of going to court? Um, it's unfortunate, but going to court is very expensive. Um, if it is determined that um, 
you don't win, you can pay a lot for an attorney. And in some cases, uh, if you're very wrong, you can pay for the other side's attorney. Um, what I said before about when you create a work, you own the copyright, that's true. But unless you register the work, um, you are not eligible for attorney's fees, nor are you eligible for what we call statutory damages, which is damages that you don't have to show proof of profit on the other side um, or loss on your side. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, the Copyright Office did a study, um, and it was basically based on this problem that we noticed that people with small claims, that is, claims less than $30,000, um, were not going to court. And the problem was that uh, unless it was over $30,000, we found that many um, copyright attorneys would not take it. And in fact, uh, there was also a study that came out around the same time that said if a claim uh, if you're taking a claim to court uh, through appeal, it could cost up to um, $350,000 uh, to go from end to end. And you know what the office saw was that this means that a lot of uh, small copyright owners, and I have to say it is mostly photographers, um, were not going to court, were not enforcing the claims. Basically, they were going to other routes, whether that was, you know, publicly embarrassing the companies or using the fact that someone used your work to get attention so you can sell your other works. Um, so what the Copyright Office did was recommended that there was a small, would be a small claims court um, for copyright uh, infringement of a lower dollar amount. And what, after our recommendation that came out uh, three years ago, this year, a member of Congress uh, introduced a bill for a small copyright claims court. Now, it would involve people who maybe didn't register their works or had lower claims, but it'd be essentially an arbitration uh, for folks that uh, had that, that particular sort of problem. I'm never gonna tell you to not enforce your copyright. I think that that is a good idea because for one, it's fair, and for two, um, it's, it teaches people to respect it. But you really have to make decisions on um, you know, the business aspect of this and, and whether it's worth it. And maybe one day uh, in the next couple of years, Congress will pass a bill to leave some of the problems with small copyright, but as for now, uh, that's just one thing we can do. Okay, uh, we've got a ton of questions coming in here on text. Um, how does patent law work if the violation is committed by a foreign company or individual? Another well, stone. okay. Um, by a foreign foreign entity. Okay, um, I'll give you an example of uh, a couple things. And I'm not an attorney. Okay, I'm a, I am a registered U.S. patent agent. And the difference is, among other things, that uh, it's the only area of law where um, you can practice if you don't have a law degree. I had to pass the uh, patent bar exam. Uh, the reason they allow you to even do that is that it's so highly technical that they need technical people to do it, and a lot of those people, such as myself, don't really want to go to law school to be able to do that. Okay, so um, I can tell you, however, from personal experience as an agent and as an inventor, that uh, most of my patents uh, were filed in the United States and about eight foreign countries. That was true in our company for most things. When I was a patent agent, I would, uh, the way they would file them in foreign countries is they would file through a foreign agent who knew the laws in that country. Um, they, they wouldn't all handle it from the U.S. They would contact me to make arguments, uh, especially technical arguments, for them in response to whatever their, their examiners were saying. In the very same way, if, let's say, let's say uh, I was with a company that had a patent in, let's say, uh, oh, in, in the EU, uh, and it was being infringed, you would hire lawyers in Europe to pursue that. And what they would pursue is the patent that, as it was actually finally allowed in Europe, which might have claims that look different from what's in the US. So 
that's how you go after them. You have to actually go after them on their own turf, sort of with their own people. In fact, I want to say a couple of general comments about patents just to put them in the context. Um, there's, a, there's a social and economic reason why patents exist. And I want to make sure people know that. Um, the Latin word root for patent is patere, or Latin is to lay open. And so the false philosophy for patents is to, to make sure the whole community has access to technological advances because that would advance the community and the economics of the world and the country. And so that's the reason for doing that. But in order to do that, you have to give rights to the people who invented the things, right? So that's why you write a patent to document that. So that goes back to like the 1400s. Um, but to keep in mind, not everything is patented. So several of the companies I worked at, we had secret sauce. And there's no way we patented it. Because we didn't want it out in the open. Now, in doing that, we gave up the right probably to ever patent that because it was in our products. Right? And if it's in your products, it's publicly disclosed, even though people don't know it's there. Um, so keep in mind, sometimes you don't necessarily want to patent things because it's so important, you keep it to your chest. Um, anyway, just FYI. There, there's one other thing about why we have patents that's kind of important. And that is that, uh, like, Thomas Jefferson was the first commissioner of U.S. patents, so it goes back all the way. And one of the reasons is that for centuries, people had had trade secrets, and so they keep them very close to the vest, and so other people don't know how they're making it. Now, progress of technology in the human race depends in many ways about knowing what, how the other people are doing something so that you can build a better mousetrap. You can do this, you can do that. So what the government does is it gives you approximately, let's say, 17 to 20 years where you can exclude others from practicing your invention if you get it. Uh, and, during, and what you give up is you have to explain to the whole public what it is. And so you can leapfrog rather than in very long increments of time. You can do it very quickly. And that's one of the reasons why our technology has moved so quickly. More recently, we have people like Elon Musk uh, choosing not to patent their technologies. Is that an ethical decision or something more uh, intellectual property? I don't, I don't understand exactly why we wouldn't. I was wondering if maybe you guys have any idea why. Well, I mean, I can, I can okay. You guys, I don't know. Okay. I don't know the answer to that, because I, I, I don't know what's in his head. Um, but I can tell you this. Um, most people, actually, most companies that are going to put a product out almost have to uh, patent it. You look at a drug company. Drug companies spend over a billion dollars. Every drug that, that you see advertised, like a billion and a half, roughly, was spent on testing it, on all the, going through all the, jumping through the hoops of regulation and everything. They'd be out of business um, if, if they didn't, if you could just have it become generic. Perhaps he's such a good businessman that he can afford to be so magnanimous and so generous to the public, but I don't know. I have a question from a musician. Just quick, I mean, Elon Musk is strictly a personal decision. Right, so Warren Buffett, he's giving away his billions and billions of dollars. Right? He pays taxes in addition to what he has to contrast with that with other people. Right? So it's strictly an ethical decision. He wants to promote that technology so it makes a world of difference to human culture. Remember, he wants one to go. He wants to go to Mars. Why is he going to do it? Because he thinks Earth is not going to last long. So he, right? He, so he doesn't care. He just does not care for the greater good. For the greater good. He, think of how much money he's got in his bank account. Yeah. He really, he really yeah. doesn't yeah. need the care. That's exactly. Right. Right. I wouldn't do that. Thank you. Right. And just a reminder, make sure you fill out your survey forms and then drop them in the box on the way out. Um, but what, what should a musician do? Copyright, patent, or trademark? Say the musician just started making music and posting it on SoundCloud. Is it best to copyright? 
Yeah, I, maybe if someone there um, wants to just go over the differences between patents, trademarks, and copyrights quickly in cases that would be obvious to know so. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? I think you want us to define trademark, um, copyright, patent. So, okay. I, well, I could do that real quickly as a person who's a uh, you know, private citizen, not an attorney. Who, I've got like 50 uh, copyrights and I've got nine trademarks. So I did, did those myself. And uh, if you want to have a real quick, if you've got an invention or a method of making something, that's going to be a patent, that sort of thing. Over on the other side, if you have uh, an animated movie, I've got, I've got it for that. Um, if you've got uh, poems, I've got it for that. Songs, a novel, I'm working on a novel right now. All those things are over in the bailiwick of copyright. In between is trademarks. And trademarks are? Well, they, they lie in between. They, they're generally put into classes for services or goods. Uh, so if you have a business that does a service, or you have a business that makes a good, uh, you can trademark the name or the, the product or you know, things of that nature. If, for example, you were going to trademark the packaging around that, or, or if you wanted to protect the packaging, you might use a patent. Yes, exactly. Yeah, there you go. There's a, there's a trademark on this Acadian. There's a little trademark symbol on this. Uh, because that's their brand of water that this company makes. Uh, and there are times, and this came up in, in the Pacenda uh, versus NFL case, where uh, copyright and trademark were bumping into each other a little bit because NFL Films had the, the voice that was used, um, just to give you a little bit of background, the Pacenda versus NFL case, this was based off of um, a what got deemed a documercial. It was a 28 minute long commercial that uh, EA Sports had made for the making of Madden 2006. And in that documercial, they used John Pacenda's real voice. They distorted it and made it more techno sounding, but they used his actual voice that was lifted off of one of the NFL films. Well, the NFL films are copyrighted, and the NFL films owns those copyrights. And they believe they have the right to use that voice because they own the copyright. We said you were using it now to endorse a product which you don't have the legal right to do. So they do come, at times can bump up against each other, but they, those are the mistakes. So, so the content there of the NFL films was under copyright, but how about the name NFL films? That would be... Well, that's a trademark, right. Exactly, that's a trademark entity known as NFL films. So what's a musician supposed to do? That was the question. <laughs> well, I would say probably. Think about you, John. So you're right. A musical or a sound recording is subject to copyright. Um, but the band's name could potentially be a trademark. Right. Yeah, the name of the band would probably be a trademark. Or, right. or yeah, or, yeah. If you were the former Prince and you just went to a symbol, that could be trademark. So my family recently started a small business. And we're wondering what we should do about the logo we have. It should be trademarked, copyrighted, registered. Well, how would we go about doing that? I would, I would say you would trademark the name of it. The, 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 would you have a logo? Yeah, logo. I would trademark the logo. Is there anything else that they might need to protect? Sometimes companies will have a catchphrase or something like that um, you know, that goes along with it. You might do that. Um, and again, you'll see sometimes in, in a company's logo. They'll have a little trademark symbol at the end of that logo as well. Can you explain what that trademark symbol looks like so that you know, the non students will know? It is the, uh, it's usually either an R with a circle around it, um, or uh, I think what's the yeah. addition is or a T Thank you. So, uh, can I jump in real quick? Because you can also copyright a logo here. As long as it's not very simple, um, $35 and register the copyright in the logo. Uh, it's like a final simple page. One other thing that's not copyrighted trademark related, uh, starting a business, 
uh, build a law in Pennsylvania, but you may want to stir your business locally, something that doesn't happen to intellectual property. Yeah, that's right. I would add, in, like in Pennsylvania, for example, um, you can get protection in the name of your businesses, in your, in your business, just by registering it with the state. And amazing, in Pennsylvania is fairly lax with that, unless the name of your business is exactly the name of another business registered in Pennsylvania, they'll give it to you. And you'll do, you have some protections with that, uh, at least within the Commonwealth. So I have another question on text. If someone has an idea for an invention or software, what are the first steps to prevent your idea from being stolen by a co-developer or someone else? Uh, don't tell anyone. That's number one, two, and three. Keep it very close to the vest. That, that's the first one. Uh, uh, others may have some uh, uh, comments on that too, but before that, I, I'm gonna pass out uh, some stuff here. Uh, I have a website that um, has a first season of animated movies on called Your Patent World. Uh, I did it all. And um, there's a promo code on this card, and then there, the, other, the other actual cards have the, uh, the website. I'm just gonna, before you, I see a lot of people leaving, I'm just gonna put them out here for anybody who wants one while you're talking. Okay. So other than not telling anybody what your idea is, Yeah, I, I believe it's a year, but here's the thing. Um, uh, anything you disclose, um, if, if you start telling people, um, if, uh, and it becomes public knowledge, it goes into what they call the public domain. Once it gets there, you can't, you can't patent your own invention because you can be cited against it, basically, because it can't be known yet to the public, uh, well, otherwise you can't can't do a, a patent. Yeah, there's a famous just for there's a famous uh, a documentary on a couple weeks ago about the Harley Davidson company. Anyone see that? It was like three or four nights long, really fascinating. Harley Davidson was doing great, and they forgot to patent one thing on their one of the original really famous bikes. Well, their competitor we first designed the bike. They saw that that was special, they patented it. Meaning they patented what Harley Davidson originally invented, and they have no protection because they didn't patent it. So when you want to do patent, it's a diction you have to be really careful. So I was going to bring in one of my engineering notebooks. When I have an idea that I think is patentable, um, first you have to define it really clearly, the technology and what's special and what's unique about it, what's you do about it, and probably how it's going to be applied. And then you want that data to witness, because eventually, if someone else comes up with the same idea, they do the same thing the day before in their notebook, it's done, right? It's their patent. Um, so, you, so you have to document it and have it witnessed and dated. So you can't just sort of be um, not specific about what you're doing. Well, I, would, I would just add an intermediate step in this. If you're talking about you're working with other people or, or you're interacting with other people about this, is have those other people sign a non-disclosure agreement. Right. Yeah. And that will keep everything within your circle. And therefore, if one of those people do jump out and then try to beat you to it or whatever, you at least have some contractual legal recourse that you can take because they weren't supposed to do that. So, so I'm going to try to jump in a little bit on both here. Um, software is an interesting question. The office, copyright office, is studying software right now. Um, one or two related issues are. Uh, we've been talking about patents. Uh, certainly software can be patentable. It's a lot more controversial compared to uh, patenting some other things. Um, and the reason for that is that for patents, uh, you have to have something not new. 
that's uh, useful and not obvious. And the software, it's a lot of different combinations of all the instructions that go with software. Maybe that had not been, been created. And uh, I guess lately there's been this concern that we're locking people out of certain invention that may have been out there before. I will say though that software is clearly patentable if it does qualify otherwise. Um, we were talking very briefly about what to do uh, recently under the American Defense Act. Act uh, patent uh, registration changed to a first to file system in the United States. Uh, we were an outlier before that. The rest of the world uh, was also going to file. Um, now we are, so get to the patent office and, and file your claim. Um, on the copyright side, software is copyrightable. Um, the code, whether it's source code or object code, you can register with the Copyright Office. In fact, there are provisions where if you say, hey, I don't want to disclose a whole of my source code, if you file the first couple of pages and an indication, um, you know, uh, an affidavit that this is what it is, uh, you can register software as the copyright. And in fact, when you fire up your computer uh, or um, an app, you frequently see, we'll see, uh, copyright registration limits uh, on software. So I think we both have to do We have a follow-up question from the musician. Hello. Uh, what are the steps in order to trademark a logo slash symbol? Can you walk me through the process, price, cost, length, all that stuff? Well, I think as the one panelist uh, mentioned, I mean, a lot of people do it themselves. You can go onto the USPTO website, um, and you know, it starts as basic as what is a trademark, and, and literally kind of takes you through it. Um, from a technical standpoint, I mean, if you can follow along with that, and, and you have your image, and you can up, you can upload it, you can do all of this online on the USPTO. I believe it's three fifty. It's three fifty, yes. Um, is the application fee? Uh, you know, you have it, it's, it's a little bit of a lengthy form, um, and you know, each each level along the way, you know, you can, you can press on a little box; it'll give you an information box to try to describe it as, as best you can. But basically, you you, know, you have to disclose you know, who's the owner of the trademark is going to be, you have the address. Uh, you know, are there particular colors or uh, stylized lettering that goes along with it? If there is, you have to describe what that is. Uh, you ultimately have to upload an image of it. Um, you know, it asks you several other questions. Uh, when it was first used or when you intend to first use it. Um, I always prefer to go that it is already being used because if you, if you have not used it yet and you intend to use it, you're going to have to follow up on your application, whereas if it's already been in use, uh, your application can be approved if, if you fill that out. <laughs> Yeah, oh, one other thing about that, and this is true in, in the patent realm too, and it's much worse over there, but uh, there are many classifications. They're called international classifications. You need to look for, you need to do a search. Look for the name and go through there and see if there's anything you think is like kind of close to it. Because once you pay your 350, it's gone. Okay, and then you have to pay another 350. And so there's, there's some subtleties uh, to doing that. Also, there, uh, if you're doing just a picture or a picture with words, that's called a design trademark, whereas just words is just a, like a standard, called a standard uh, trademark. They're separate things. One other thing is that if you do a picture and it's in color, submit it in black and white, because if you submit it in color, everything, only that one exact logo in those exact colors uh, will be covered. If you do it in black and white, any colors you pick will be covered. It's a quirk, but... That's $350, right? $350. No, $3.50. No, no, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a real thing. Uh, Jeff, you have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry, I think Have a notary do it, or just someone you trust. Right? 
but I, I will also say that um, um, a thing that's really got to be in your mind, a couple things. One is that, as was mentioned in the America Invents Act, it used to be whoever invented it first, so you needed that kind of proof. Now it's, and, and that kind of proof I still go with, it's still important, but it's who gets to the patent office and files first. If, if you do it, and you do it, and you get there five nanoseconds quicker, it's yours. Nothing you can do about it. Um, so that's, a, that's an important thing. The other thing is what they call the scope of the patent. You need to think it through really well because let's say you think it's this big, your idea is this big, and you, 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 it's actually this big and it's like this, and you go ahead and you write it up and you claim it. Um, later on, um, you may wish that you had done it this big. Another thing you gotta watch out for, you gotta do a search, and this is tough, I can tell you. You gotta do a search, and to find out who else has done it, because if you've got this idea, and they've got this idea, and they already have a patent, and it overlaps your idea, and it cuts this piece out of it, unless you've got wording inside your patent already, or, or your application already, that can like, squish over and not be in this person's way, your, pa your application uh, will never get along. So it, it's tricky business, but you gotta, you gotta consider a lot of things. So I can give you a simple geometric example. So one of the laser structures we worked with had, you might want to call it a triangular shape, which really made that 10 to 100 times more powerful, literally. And so we're trying to figure out how to word that to be the most generically worded so that it would cover lots of other shapes. That's the shape we chose to use. And so we just ended up calling it, well, those edges of the laser structure were just non-parallel. Does that make sense? That covers every shape that's not parallel, because really what matters is if they're parallel, you're kind of in trouble, meaning not good things would happen. And so that that's, was very, no one could overlap that, right, because it's so generically worded. Another thing is, I want to make sure people also get an understanding of patents is, we're, we're taking a very individual view of it, but keep in mind, large corporations, even small and medium ones, if they're good at what they're doing, they're actually strategically defining the patents. They're looking at everyone else's competitors, even non-competitors, and looking for where they can fit into the holes and gaps. Um, so typically for us and the companies I work with, two to five times a year, we have strategic patent meetings where we would all do some little research to understand competitors and non-competitors, and we'd go after areas that, even though I wasn't working on as a scientist, we wanted to patent that idea, because we now eventually, 10 years later, have a portfolio that would eliminate Samsung from getting into our laser designs, totally, which means the portfolio is worth a lot more money, and now you can sell that for hundreds of millions of dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, everyone who has attended as well as the speakers, but there's a good number of students who have class at 12.30. I know that because I will see you in about five minutes. Uh, 1.30. 12.30, So we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to help us. And ladies and gentlemen, you can now